This is Concept D classes and today we'll deal with part 1 of chapter 4 in class 9 science structure of an atom. So in part 1 first we'll see about atoms then the charged particles in an atom such as proton and electron then we'll see about the structure of an atom where we see how various scientists they proposed various atomic models to explain the structure of an atom. The rest of the topics will be discussed in part 2. So in chapter 3, we have already learned that atoms and molecules are the fundamental building blocks of matter. We know that matter exists around us. The existence of different kinds of matter is due to the different atoms constituting them. We also saw the postulates of Dalton atomics theory, right? There we saw that all the matter is made up of small particles called as atoms. These atoms are indivisible. They cannot be further divided. All the atoms of an element are the same, whereas atoms of different elements are different, right? So the question that arises is that what makes the atom of one element different from the atom of another element? And are these atoms really indivisible? Can they not be divided further? Or are there any other smaller constituents inside this atom? So we learn the answers to all these questions in this chapter. We learn about the subatomic particles, the various models uh, that explain how these mat particles are arranged within an atom. We we'll study all about this in this chapter. Now, a major challenge before the scientists at the end of this 19th century was the structure of an atom. They wanted to reveal the structure of an atom as well as to explain its properties. And the, all these explanations is based on a series of experiments. And one of the first indication that atoms can be divided came from studying the static electricity. You might have experienced, right, when we touch a knob, we might uh, feel a little shock. That is mainly due to the transfer of electric charges. So it means that there are some charged particles inside every matter. So that's what we're going to study in the next topic. Charged particles in matter. So for understanding the nature of charged particles in matter, let's consider these activities. First comb a dry hair. Does this comb attract small pieces of paper? Similarly, rub a glass road with a silk cloth and then bring that road near an inflated balloon. Do it stick each other? Yes, from these activities, we can conclude that on rubbing two objects together, they become electrically charged and that is why they attract each other. Now, where does this charge come from? The question can be answered by knowing that an atom is divisible and it consists of some charged particles. So many scientists actually contributed in revealing the presence of charged particles in an atom. One such scientist was Sir Joseph John Thomson. He discovered that even though atom was indivisible, it contained at least one subatomic particle called as electron. So actually J.J. Thomson carried a cathode ray experiment in which he observed a stream of negatively charged particle coming out of the cathode towards the anode and he called this negatively charged particle as electron. Another such scientist was Eugene Goldstein. In 1886, even before the electron was identified, he discovered the presence of protons. So he too observed the same uh, discharge tube, that is the cathode ray experiment, the apparatus was something like this. So this cathode is actually an electrode having a negative charge and anode is an electrode having positive charge. So when this cathode rays were produced at high voltage and low pressure, they traveled through the gas in a discharge tube. So while doing so, these ray, rays, they take the electrons of the gas along with it, leaving behind the positively charged particles in the gas and these particles they form the canal rays see this blue color canal rays and they started moving towards the cathode that is the negatively charged electrode so these rays were positively charged radiations which ultimately led to the discovery of another subatomic particle called as protons now this subatomic particle called as proton had this charge equal in magnitude but opposite in sign that is, if electron is negative, proton is positive, and its mass was approximately 2000 times as that of an electron. So, the credit 
for the discovery of electrons and protons got goes to jj thomson and e goldstein respectively so if you want to know more about the experiments of jj thomson and e goldstein message me in the comment section i'll give you a separate lecture of how they discovered electrons and protons so in general we can say that an electron is represented as e minus and a proton as p plus the mass of a proton is taken as one unit and its charge is plus 1 whereas the mass of an electron is considered to be negligible and its charge is minus 1 the symbol is e minus and proton is p plus so an atom is composed of protons and electrons mutually balancing their charges it also appeared that the protons were in the interior of an atom whereas electrons were in outermost region and they could easily be removed so the next big question was what sort of structure did these particles of atoms form so now after knowing about atoms different atoms were made to know about the structure of an atom the next topic is structure of an atom so as we have learned in chapter 3 dalton's atomic theory suggested that atom was indivisible that is it cannot be divided further and it atom was indestructible we cannot destroy it as well but with the discovery of two fundamental particles electrons and protons inside the atom this led to the failure of this aspect of dalton's atomic theory it was then considered necessary to know how this electrons and protons are arranged within an atom so for explaining this many scientists proposed various atomic models so some of the models that we are going to study in this chapter are thomson's model of an atom Rutherford's model of an atom and Bohr's model of an atom. So first let's see about Thomson's model of an atom. So who was JJ Thomson? Sir Joseph John Thomson was a British physicist born in Manchester on 18 December 1856. He was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1906 for his work on the discovery of electrons. He directed the Cavendish Laboratory at Cambridge for 35 years. and seven of his research assistants subsequently won the nobel prizes so thomson proposed a model of an atom to be similar to that of a christmas pudding that's why this model is also termed as plum pudding model so according to him he said that this electrons in a sphere of positive charge were like dry fruits in a spherical christmas pudding so just like how the dry fruits are present in a, a spherical christmas cake the electrons are just like that they are embedded in this positive sphere we can also think of a watermelon all the positive charge of an atom is spread over like the red edible part of the watermelon whereas uh, the electrons are like seeds inside the watermelon so thomson proposed that an atom consists of a positively charged sphere and the electrons are embedded in it and he also proposed that the negative and the positive charges are equal in magnitude so the atom as a whole is electrically neutral although thomson's model explained that atoms are electrically neutral they failed to explain how the protons and electrons are arranged in an atom because if they are so close to each other opposite charges will attract each other then how can we explain that they are electrically neutral so this was one of the drawbacks of thomson's model Now let's see the next model which is the Rutherford's model of an atom. Ernest Rutherford was born at Spring Grove on 30th August 1871. He was known as the father of nuclear physics. He is famous for his work on the radioactivity and the discovery of nucleus of an atom with the gold foil experiment. He got the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1908. So Ernest Rutherford was interested in how the electrons are arranged within an atom. So in order to understand it individually, he designed an experiment where fast alpha moving particles were made to fall on a thin gold foil. So there is a alpha particle source like a radioactive substance and this alpha rays are allowed to fall on this gold foils. So this alpha particles are actually alpha uh, rays or positively charged rays. and he selected this gold foil because he wanted a very thin layer 
and this gold foil was about 1000 atoms thick and this alpha particles as we said are actually uh, positively charged rays or we can say that they are doubly charged helium ions if we say it in terms of protons and neutrons this alpha particle consists of two protons and two neutrons bounded together into a particle which is identical to helium 4 nucleus so we can say that they have a mass of 4u hence this fast moving alpha particles have a considerable amount of energy so he expected that this alpha particles would be deflected by the sub atomic particles in the golden foil okay so he knew that this alpha particles would be deflected that's why he put a deflection screen that is movable but since this alpha particles were much heavier than the protons he did not expect to see such large deflections but this alpha scattering experiment gave Rutherford totally unexpected results the following observations were made so this is the scattering of a alpha particles by a gold foil most of the fast moving alpha particles passed straight through the gold foil some of the alpha particles were deflected by the foil by small angles surprisingly one out of every 12,000 particles appeared to rebound so in the words of Rutherford this result was almost very incredible so let us think of an activity in an open field to understand uh, this results of this experiment so let a child stand in front of a wall with his eyes closed let him throw stones at the wall from a distance he will hear the sound when each stone strikes the wall if he repeat this 10 times he will hear the sound 10 times but if a blindfolded child were to throw stones at a barbed wire fence most of the stones would not hit the fence and no sounds would be heard this is because there are a lot of gaps in the fence which allow the stone to pass through them so from a similar reasoning Rutherford concluded from the alpha particle scattering experiment that most of the space inside the atom is empty because most of the alpha particles passed through the gold foil without getting deflected okay so there is a lot of space empty space within an atom now very few particles were deflected from their path indicating that there is a positive charge of an atom and it occupies a very little space now a very small fraction of this alpha particles were deflected 180 degree indicating that all the positive charges and mass of the gold atom were concentrated in a very small volume within the atom so from this data he found out that there was a nucleus in between which consists of positive charge and he calculated the radius of the nucleus is about 105 times less than the radius of an atom so on the basis of his experiment Rutherford put forward a nuclear model of an atom which had the following features first he found out that there is a positively charged center in an atom called as nucleus and nearly all the mass of an atom resides in the nucleus now there is electrons that revolve around the nucleus in circular path then the size of the nucleus is very small as compared to the size of an atom but this model also had a few limitations and some of the questions were left unanswered so what were the drawbacks of the Rutherford's model mainly was the case of stability of an atom the revolution of an electron in a circular orbit is not expected to be stable because any particle in a circular orbit would undergo acceleration and during the acceleration the charged particles would radiate energy thus the revolving electron would lose the energy and finally fall into the nucleus if this were to happen the atom would be highly unstable hence the matter would not exist we know that the atoms are quite stable hence the stability of an atom could not be explained by this Rutherford's model now let's see the Bohr's model of an atom Niels Bohr was born in Copenhagen on 7th October 1885 he was appointed professor of physics at Copenhagen University in 1960 he got the Nobel Prize for his work on the structure of atom in 1922 and this model was quite successful as well 
Now, among Professor Bohr's numerous writing, three appearings as books are The Theory of Spectra and Atomic Constitution, Atomic Theory and Description of Nature. So in order to overcome the objections raised against Rutherford's model of an atom, forward the following postulates about the model of an atom. So he said that there are special orbits of electrons inside the atom and while electrons revolve in discrete orbits, they do not radiate energy. So he said that there is a nucleus and outside the nu nucleus, there are orbits or shells called as energy levels, which are de designated as K, L, M and N all the numbers n is equal to 1 2 3 and 4 so this model was the most successful he proposed that the electrons are distributed in different energy shells with discrete energy around the nucleus now let's see how neutrons were discovered in 1932 james chadwick discovered another subatomic particle which had no charge and a mass nearly equal to that of a proton so he was studying about the mass of atomic particles and as we know the mass of an atom is in the nucleus but the nucleus consists of positively charged atoms that is it consists of protons but the mass of an atom is not equal to the number of protons hence this showed that the nucleus consists of some other particle that contributed towards a mass but had no charge so chadwick named this subatomic particle which had no charge as neutron the neutrons are present in the nucleus of all the atoms except that of hydrogen and in general neutron is represented as n so the mass of an atom is therefore given by the sum of the masses of protons and neutrons present inside the nucleus hence in conclusion we can say that the atom consists of three subatomic particles protons neutrons and electrons So that's all for part one. In part two, we'll discuss how these electrons are distributed in the different uh, shells or orbits. We'll also study about valency, then about atomic number and mass number, and finally about isotopes. So tune in soon for the next session. Till then, stay safe, take care, and may God bless you all. Thank you and bye-bye.